So you note, of course, where we have representatives who do take different angles to the ecology question. So we turn now to an academic. Uh, Professor Celia Dean Drummond is a uh, English woman, uh, has worked for years in the States, uh, has been the uh, professor of theology at Notre Dame University and visiting professor at Durham University back in England. In Notre Dame, she was director of the Center of Theology, Science and Human Flourishing and uh, she is, uh, has published many books, but her next book, which she encourages you to look up on Amazon, uh, will be soon published, Theological Ethics Through a Multi-Species Lens. Um, the, but uh, her current job is uh, in the um, Laudato Si Research Institute, Campion Hall in Oxford. Campion Hall is a Jesuit hall and so I, I'm Irish, so we're, we're, we hear a lot about very creative initiatives happening in the British province uh, of the Jesuits in response to Laudato Si. And a kind of leading edge of this is the research centre in uh, Campion Hall. But um, just remember, why be an academic? Why take an academic approach to the uh, ecological crisis? Over to you, Celia. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction and uh, thank you for, for bearing with me. All I can say really is something of, of footnotes after these two really inspiring talks and in a sense um, what I have to say wouldn't exist without the kind of work that Mauricio and, and also Thomas have, have been doing. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank the organisers of course for inviting me to say something to you this afternoon. Um, I've been asked, been asked to speak as an academic. Um, an academic sounds like someone who sits on an ivory, in an ivory tower while the rest of the world burns. Um, it's not quite like that. Um, those of, who've been involved in linking ecology and theology for the last 30 years, which is what I've been doing, have always been embedded in practices, um, in the practice of ecology or environmental issues, um, the demise of the environment, What's happened more recently is the awareness of that intersection with poverty issues. And it was in 2009 that I became, um, uh, on, I went on a secondment with CAFOD for one year. That is, I left my academic job for a year um, and spent a full year with, with CAFOD working with them in some of their projects. Um, I, I published a little book called Seeds of Hope facing the challenge of climate justice in 2010, and it was sent to all the bishops in England um, that year. Whether they read it or not, I don't know, but it was sent to them. It was a very uh, accessible little booklet. The point is that that experience for me was also transforming. Um, meeting members of the Maasai tribe, especially women in that community, who spoke out uh, even though they were not formally educated with such articulation, and such um, common sense, but also with such grace. Their gratitude, solidarity, and generosity, I'll never forget. And in, in a sense, what I want to start off by saying is that in the current context of the Amazonian Synod, the most important thing is to listen. To listen to the cry of the heart, which is coming out even in the pre-Amazonian um, Synod document, to the nature of that violence which is being meted out that Mauricio uh, illustrated so uh, well. Um, the fact that those living in the Amazonian regions and many other indigenous communities in the world see uh, other creatures as their kin. We are murdering Mother Earth, the Earth, our mother. And that horrendous violence shouldn't just stir up in us uh, compassion. The first step for even for an academic, is to allow people who are, are suffering those oppressive conditions to speak. They cannot become just recipients of charity. We also, in the privileged West, need to think about how we are contributing to that suffering and the injustices that are being suffered. So um, in thinking about that um, new kind of listening that's called for even in those in specialist uh, uh, areas in, ac in academia and other places, 
I was struck by um, Prover the Proverbs uh, quotation from Proverbs 40. You, um, my ears have you opened, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. So the sense in which we need to have our ears opened to hear. Be attentive then to what the inner spirit might be saying to us. And as a theologian, bringing our spirituality in that inner ear of listening is just as important as when uh, we're out in, in sort of doing our activism. We have to, if you like, stand back and take time to contemplate and reflect and think, how are we going to respond to this situation? The Laudato Si Research Institute is very new. Um, it, we've, the idea came about a year ago, but it's been um, mapped out carefully and um, gradually over the last 12 months. Um, it's barely opened, but because of the Amazonian Synod, we believe that it was an opportunity too good to miss. And so just last Friday, we gathered together different academics um, from different disciplines at the University of Oxford, including uh, those in hydrology, those in anthropology, those in um, other sciences and theologians and philosophers. But we are fortunate that it turns out that visiting the anthropology department was someone called Philippe Cruz, who was a representative from the Tuxa community, who is also a lecturer in social anthropology at the State University of Brahia in Brazil. Um, and he gave us a first-hand account of some of the martyrs who had, been, who had died as a result of trying to protect their land. And what he also said um, uh, in the course of our, of our conversation, which is something I, I didn't understand fully before, was that the biodiversity that we see around us in the Amazonian region is also not just a simple result of um, being untouched land, but the result of people, the, pe um, the indigenous peoples living there and actually taking care of, the, uh, of that biodiversity. So there's a sense in which um, the intersection between those living in the, in the Amazonian region and the way the, the, the space is conserved, as it were, is all part and parcel of the, of the same story. And in this respect, um, one of his criticisms was the way conservation ethics has tended to um, uh, treat such places as an empty space. And I think that's also something that Mauricio mentioned. But that is a complete misjudgment. Uh, I think myself that um, Cons conservation ethicists are now starting to change, that it's not quite as simple as that anymore. But one of the reasons for having this roundtable conversation was to allow us to hear each other and actually become more aware than we were before of what other perspectives might entail, including disciplines such as anthropology, social anthropology, theology, and philosophy, and so on. So we heard also from... Isadora Acropeet, who is based at, also at the base at the University of Brasilia, um, and, and who works on, alongside the Quilomba, com, Quim, Quilombola communities, whose land is also seriously threatened. The point is that these are young academics in their 20s who are actually research, doing serious research, but are also bringing to the discussion at the table of Oxford, the University of Oxford, those who are uh, more established in their, in their positions, and if you like, challenging us to think differently about how to approach particular problems. I believe that one of the things we want to do as a research institute is to bring people from different uh, disciplines together in dialogue, in serious dialogue, bringing our particular gifts but also recognizing that the language that we use may need some explaining. Most of us are also involved in education as well as research, and so it's a, it's a very humbling task to realize your own ignorance when you encounter another discipline. But the problems that we face are far too difficult and complicated to be tackled from one discipline alone. And the tendency or the temptation of the academic is to believe that their own particular specialty has all the answers. 
or that one's own experience as an academic means that one's, we're somehow um, more able to speak compared to those who are perhaps newer in the field. When you get involved in transdisciplinary conversations, it soon becomes apparent that there's a, it's more like a, a level playing field um, where graduate students, uh, professors who've been academics for years and others are, are there, if you like, sharing the table. So it's a, if, in a way, it sort of echoes this synodial approach that started to emerge in the church. We need to undo the structures of academia and start thinking differently and afresh about how to do research and to do it well. I believe that it's this kind of trans transdisciplinary research as a result of it in contact and engagement with other disciplines is risky. It also can have some resistance by those who look to different uh, older models of, of specialization and narrowing. But we need to move from a culture that stresses individual subjects and sciences to one that aims for wisdom and integration. I think theology has tended to avoid such risky adventures into the life worlds of other academic communities. Um, and apart from perhaps uh, discourses in philosophy or maybe biblical studies, but it's time for theologians to be more adventurous. adventurous. Pope Francis talked about daring prudence or practical wisdom. I think we need to be daring in our life as academics. And it's harder for academics to do that because they're used to having the security of a particular specialty. But we need to move outside that and be prepared to, to be guided by the Holy Spirit in the choices that we make. So we have to accept the contingency and the uncertainty and the admission that we do not necessarily know all the answers in coming together in this way. Prudential language in the common Western understanding of the term might imply caution, but the precautionary principle has dominated environmental ethics for too long, especially the secular forms of ethics. And it's time now to do something else, to draw those threads together in a new strategic plan, beginning at the local level, but also looking at other levels as well and starting to work out how can we change the structures of oppression that are part of the, the problems that we face. Moving structures away from structures of sin towards alternatives, I think is very challenging and we haven't got there yet but I don't think it's impossible. I'm a scientist and a, theolo and a theologian. I have a background in plant physiology. I trained in agricultural botany. I used model physiological systems to look at some of the most intriguing aspects of the way plants work. I know from my experience that scientific uh, research can have a positive effect on crop yields but I also know that alternative patterns of agriculture need to be put in place other than monocropping that's dominated the Western world and the green revolution, so-called green revolution. I also know that the Amazon clearance projects have been particularly destructive and GMOs were coming into, the, into vogue just at the time when, uh, when, I, when I did my plant research and it was also the time when I decided that these huge global problems needed some serious thought and therefore I decided to move away from science and turn to theological ethics and theology. But the mobilization of public voices in Europe around GMOs actually halted its progress in the Western world and in Europe, but it hasn't halted its spread in some of the more vulnerable communities of the world. And I think that, in a sense, is a lesson that global mobilization of peoples can actually put, uh, prevent things happening that may look inevitable, but also the most vulnerable are likely to be exploited in the process. So getting scientists, social scientists, theologians and philosophers, philosophers to get together to reflect on some of the, the most intractable problems that we face today is one step forward. 
I think the, what is less clear is what then the strategic plan needs to be, and maybe we're going to hear that in the, in the final session today. Ecological conversion, I would agree with Thomas, is absolutely critical in moving forward a practical ex uh, expression of the meaning of integral ecology. And integral ecology isn't simply bringing ecology and poverty and other areas together. It's also an ontological view that stresses the intrinsic worth of all creatures and including the special place and responsibility of human beings. The point, the point I'm trying to make is that the most vulnerable creatures deserve the, the special at attention. And um, moving from a place where the strong motivation to care to a change of heart or metanoia, as uh, uh, the ecumenical patriarch said at least 25 years ago, um, is something we're, we're all trying to orientate towards. And it's one reason why I think practitioners and academics need to work together rather than in separation. And so I would press for a closer community of those who are activists with those who are in academia so that we can begin to work out together what might be the poten potential way forward, but also so that we can give each other the space to think and reflect and discern what might be the best thing to do given the circumstances that we're familiar with. I know that from my experience of working with CAPOD that sometimes activism becomes so intense that there's not the space to discern where to move next. But also, um, the temptation of the academic is to forget about practice. So the joining of these two areas together is absolutely critical. In my vision for the Laudato C Research Institute, we have an academic research network that's joining together different areas of academic study, including not just philosophy and theology, but also the social and the natural sciences, and medicine that also needs to move in the same direction, but is a space where scholars and others can come together and be mutually stimulated and reinforced by each other's research. Understanding uh, uh, such ecological conversion, as it were, between disciplines and within disciplines and even within, within academia itself uh, and as integral to the life of every Christian is not a newfangled theology but was there um, right from the beginning of the Christian, the start of the Christian faith. That's why the orthodox ecumenical patriarch has made it um, so, so much his own message Basil of Caesarea to Maximus Confessor and even Augustine of Hippo put creation up there front and centre. So I think we need to uh, recover some of those forgotten traditions in theology, but also foster the ecological virtues um, in those we educate and not just give them information, but give them other things as well. That we, if uh, ecological conversion is going to start to work um, at the individual as well as the societal levels. So we need to be prepared to take more risks, to have that daring prudential reasoning that Pope Francis is pointing towards. I'm going to end uh, today uh, to, with just a sampling of a few provocative questions. Do we risk bringing to the table those who have wealth and power alongside those who are living in the regions of the world most affected by their actions? Could consciences and the possibility of in integral ecological awakening be aroused by such encounters, rather like um, the South African uh, encounter between the oppressors and the oppressed? Can there be a wider global mo mobilization of ordinary people who are shareholders in the relevant transnational companies in order to press for even more radical changes. So I don't think it's just the youth who should have bold and radical aspirations. I think it needs to be true of all of us, whatever our age, whatever stage of life, we need to come together and actually get behind this because we only have one earth, there's no plan, plan B. So the next generation isn't gonna have uh, um, a desirable earth to live on 
and eventually it's going to affect everybody, even those living in this beautiful city of Rome. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia.